Hey everybody, I'm Sean Powers, and today we're going to dive right into the Linux Plus course where we left off uh, on section 2.3. Now we're going to cover this entire objective uh, during this video, uh, but it's not going to be terribly complicated. The main thing is you have to understand how firewalls work, and then we're going to do a couple use cases where we actually use the two different types of uh, manipulation tools that are mentioned uh, to do things. Now, I do want to cover a couple things like uh, these key features. Uh, they're odd features to pull out on their own, but nonetheless, uh, zones are, uh, they're, they're a concept that you can use with Firewall D, which is one of the tools that we're going to look at. And it's basically a nice way to separate zones. Like if you are at work, you can have like a firewall and install that for your work zone. So you can have uh, things come in and be blocked or be allowed at work. And then you can have another zone for like, the public, like let's say you're going to be in a coffee shop and then one at home. So zones are basically just a set of rules that you can apply for a certain uh, situation. And that's a feature of Firewall D. Uh, services is just a way to specify the various things that we would uh, allow in. Like if we allow an opening in our firewall to allow uh, web traffic in, for example, that service would be uh, a web service or HTTP and HTTPS services. And basically they just map to ports, right? For uh, HTTP, it's going to be port 80. For HTTPS, it's going to be port 443. So it's basically just a way to refer to what ports we're going to open for a particular service. Uh, and then stateful versus stateless. Now, this is a little bit tougher to understand, but not too bad. Basically, a stateful connection is when somebody from the outside or from the inside out connects two computers together. So like client and server, they're connected, but they keep their connection active so that they can send information back and forth across that established stateful connection. That state stays connected, okay? And the advantage of a stateful connection is you allow that first, you know, packet in or you establish it from the inside out to a remote, a remote server and then both sides can communicate back and forth through that stateful connection that has been established. Once it's established, it's treated in a way that, okay, it's up so traffic can go both ways. Now, stateless means that a port like on your firewall is open so you can have traffic come in, but as soon as that connection and that transfer of data is done, there's no more connection, right? It, it, it loses state. It doesn't, it doesn't remember that those two were talking. And so every time, uh, information has to come into the, you know, past the firewall, it has to meet the rules. So like the outside server can't just keep talking to the inside server if that state isn't established and kept. So stateless is, it just means that basically uh, it, it doesn't stay active. So every time information tries to come in, it has to establish a connection and it doesn't keep that state. So that's stateful versus stateless and uh, routers uh, or and or firewalls, the statefulness is something that has to be kept track of, right? Like they have to have a, a table of connections that remain connected, stateful. And so it can use more memory to have a stateful connection between, you know, the client and server. Uh, so too big of a list of stateful connections can require a bigger firewall with more memory and that sort of a thing. So uh, that's probably all you need to understand as far as stateful and stateless goes. Uh, but nonetheless, there are <laughs> there are two main uh, firewall manipulation tools that exist on the kernel level. And then we have two different sort of wrappers around those underlying uh, things that we can use to manipulate them. So let's go back to that slide and I'll show you what I mean. We have uh, right here, common firewall technologies. These are in really odd orders because IP tables uh, and NF tables, uh, these are both kernel level tools that allow the, the kernel to say what can and can't go through a firewall. So these are pretty much similar in function, IP tables being the older technology that is slowly being replaced with NF tables. And so that's why they're both listed. Um, however, again, I don't know why they're in this order. Uh, firewall D and uncomplicated firewall are kind of like a wrapper that is an easier way to manipulate those underlying tools. Because I'll be honest, IP tables it can be really, really complicated to write and understand the rules that are going on. Because basically how 
uh, I'm going to start with IP tables again. It's the oldest one. Uh, you have basically rules that apply to a particular interface. You have like uh, a table for uh, the incoming port or the incoming traffic on that port. You have it for like the outgoing, meaning coming into the computer. So like the the Ethernet port is you know, it's access to the outside world and you can specify rules for at the very edge and then the inside edge. Uh, also, you can specify tables to do network address translation. So like if you have internal computers that are all on like a private IP range, it is IP tables that then become sort of a router kind of. So, I mean, that's a little bit beyond the scope of this firewall video, uh, but nonetheless, it gets really complicated. That's, that's kind of my point is it gets really, really complicated. Um, so rather than manipulate IP tables directly, which you can do, uh, we generally use tools like uncomplicated firewall in Debian or I don't know if it's in Debian by default, but uh, it's in Ubuntu by default. This is the the wrapper to manipulate IP tables or firewall D, which is the default in like Red Hat and and Fedora and things like that. Um, the actual tool is firewall dash CMD to manipulate firewall D. Uh, but it's important to note that the actual firewall itself is either IP tables or the newer NF tables. And NF tables is just a slightly simpler, it's a newer way of doing the same thing that IP tables did. Again, that's not there's more nuance, but that's, you know, that's probably all you need to know uh, that NF tables is replacing IP tables. But because this is Linux, there's a lot of like uh, backwards compatibility things. So as long as you understand how to use un uncomplicated firewall or firewall D, you're going to be able to manipulate the firewall, whether, whether your current version is using IP tables or it's using NF tables, you may not even know what's happening behind the scenes. And so that is okay. And that's what's really nice about having a wrapper system like one of these two uh, in place. But basically, uncomplicated firewall is far simpler than even firewall D, but they create the rules in the background that are applied at the kernel level. They create these IP table uh, tables and rules that get applied. And so um, when you are doing system administration, you generally have to know how to use uncomplicated firewall or firewall D tools. And so I'll show you really quickly how to use both of those, uh, again, using Ubuntu and we're gonna use Rocky Linux because again, it comes, firewall D is the default in a Red Hat based system and uncomplicated firewall is the default in an Ubuntu based system. So we're here on Ubuntu and you'll notice that I am root here on the Ubuntu system. I could use sudo, but I just became root so that it was easier and I didn't forget to type sudo. And uncomplicated firewall by default is not uh, enabled, so by default, it's inactive, I think. I don't think I messed that up, but it's, I'm pretty sure that's the default. Uh, in order to activate it, you just simply do UFW enable. Did I type that wrong? Oh, yeah, I have to spell enable correctly. And now it's active and it's enabled on system startup, which means that uh, when you do something with UFW, it creates something so that it will stay persistent on reboot. So right now it's going to come up and it's not allowing anything in. And we can, we can tell that by saying UFW status, and it's going to say it's active, but it doesn't tell us that there's any ports open. So let's say we installed a web server and we wanted to make sure that people could actually access it from the outside. We would say UFW allow, and then we would use those services. Remember I talked about services are pointing to the ports that they require. So I could say uh, UFW allow HTTP, and then we can do multiples by just putting a comma in HTTPS. So if I do that, interesting. Well, you used to be able to do it that way. We have to do it one at a time now. UFW allow HTTP, okay, and UFW allow HTTPS. Okay, forgive me, you used to be able to do a comma. Maybe you can't now. Uh, nonetheless, uh, we've enabled both of those services, and now if we do UFW status, we're going to see that these have now been opened up. So basically, uh, port 80 and port 443 uh, both with IP version four and IP version six are allowed from anywhere, meaning that we can anywhere on the internet or anywhere on that this network port is going to be available. In our case, it's an internal network, so it's just going to be available internally. Um, it will allow that traffic to come in on these ports. Now it's a little bit more complicated on the firewall D and I mean, 
pun intended there, right? This is called uncomplicated firewall. And so the one that's slightly more complicated is the other option, which is firewall D. And that is what comes with Rocky Linux or Red Hat Enterprise Linux or Fedora. Now there are, like I said, zones that work with firewall D. So we could say firewall dash CMD, which is the command line tool to manipulate firewall D. Uh, we could say dash dash, well, first of all, if we do dash dash help, we're gonna see all the commands that we can do. So there's a bunch of different commands that we can do, uh, but we're going to learn just a couple right now. And the first one might be uh, get default zone and it's probably going to be public yeah so this is the the default zone if you don't mess up you know don't mess up if you don't create other zones it's going to use public it's the default zone and so that's what we're going to manipulate today just know that zones exist and you can create new ones and then switch between them as you need to all right so we could say firewall oops, firewall cmd list services and this is going to show us what services are currently allowed. Now, again, you'll see it's a little bit different than uh, with uncomplicated firewall. It just shows us a list of the services that are allowed in. Right now, SSH is allowed in, DHCP version six client is allowed, and cockpit, I don't even know what cockpit is. It's a program that is allowed and opened up, the, the firewall is opened up to allow that. Uh, but we can add uh, another one if we wanted. We could say firewall CMD, dash dash add dash service equals HTTP and press enter. And now if we do list services, we're going to see that it has been added. So HTTP has been added. Uh, however, firewall D doesn't automatically have it happen on boot. If we wanted to have that uh, stick and like uh, stay open on boot, and also we would have to uh, do HTTPS if we wanted both, uh, HTTP and HTTPS, just like uncomplicated firewall. You have to you have to specify both of them. So if we did that, uh, it but when we restart it, it would not stick. If we wanted it to stick, we would have to do firewall dash cmd dash dash permanent dash dash add service equals HTTP and then HTTPS. And now if you restart, it will uh, stay because it is permanent. Like those original ones were already permanent. These three that came set up by default, those were already permanent. And since now we've added these with the permanent flag, this will be, this will be permanent too if we restart the computer. Now, the other thing specified in this uh, particular objective is talking about how to enable and disable IP forwarding. Now we covered that in a video a while back, but that is basically, uh, what allows your Linux computer to act as a router, particularly, oh, I, well, act as a router, but that's generally used when you have like a, a NAT or a network address translation happening. And that is in the proc file system, uh, you can specify IP forwarding equals one for yes, or by default it's zero for no. And then when you set up uh, firewall rules to allow masquerading, uh, it will allow that to come through. But uh, that's pretty much how firewalls work. And again, the important thing to know is that IP tables uh, has kind of been the standard for a long time. I mean, if you want some weird history, before that it was IP chains, uh, then IP tables took over, and now NF tables is taking over. And depending on what version of what distribution you have, you may have IP tables, you may have NF tables, but because we use a wrapper and because a lot of this stuff is even backwards compatible, if you were to like directly use IP tables uh, nomenclature when modifying NF tables stuff, it'll probably still work because they try to make it backwards compatible. Uh, even though uh, it can be simpler, you can still use that anyway. Um, but using the tools like UFW or firewall-cmd, uh, we can more easily manipulate the firewall rules regardless of what the back end actually is. So anyway, here my dog's barking, so I'm gonna go take care of them, but hopefully this was helpful. Uh, remember to learn everything, do what you love, and most importantly, be kind. Hopefully it won't take as long for me to get to the next video, and I will see you then.